Hey everybody, my name is Harley Smith. I'm going to be your teacher today. I'm going to do plant pop propagation and cloning. Um, I've been in the hydroponics industry now for about 20 years. Uh, I started out just working with schools years ago, doing professional development workshops for agriculture teachers. And then later on, I did a little bit of uh, retail sales in a store like this, but in Detroit. I managed the store for a while, and then Eventually, though, I continued to learn more and more about the plant science. I, I wasn't really satisfied with just knowing the sales hype. You know, I wanted to know why, how does it work, what's in it, what are these active ingredients, you know, what things work well together, what things were, are we just wasting money on. I wanted to go beyond those, so I kept doing intense research uh, for years on plant nutrition and organic biostimulants, and eventually I graduated to get the white coat. I was doing R&D. So today I'm uh, actually the research developer, or develop, uh, research director for MPK Industries um, and the raw line. And we'll talk a little bit about those products, but the products really aren't the thing. It's about the needs of the plants. That's what we want to focus on. Those raw ingredients are in a lot of different products. But we'll be talking about really some things you can do to make your own recipes for some rooting uh, nutrients today, some root stimulants. And you'll learn the, the difference between a, a cloning gel and a root stimulant that they do. And, then, and a few tricks for how to get better results for, for clones. I'll show you how to, uh, just by your, changing your nutrition for the mother plants, that you can cut your rooting time for your cuttings in half. So some of these things we, are in the books. Some of these things we all know just from experience. But a little education can help us make some better choices down the road, road and get some better results. So let's start out with uh, the two ways of propagation. You can start from either seeds or from cuttings, cloning. Seeds are sexual reproduction. So there's a combination of genes. You could buy a pack of six seeds, plant them, and you can have very different characteristics from plant to plant. Every plant will be a unique individual when it's grown from seed. Um, now if you start from cuttings though, Every cutting will be genetically identical to the mother plant that it came from. So if you, theoretically again, I'm saying theoretically, if you took the cuttings from the same mother, grew them in the same exact environment, with the same nutrition, you get the same results every time. So what is better, going from seeds or cuttings? Really, if you're a breeder, you want to do both. You want to do seeds for the diversity, so you can start selecting for the characteristics that you want the most that are most desirable for you to you. And then once you find that superior plant, the one that has all the aromas and colors and all the characteristics you want, then take cuttings from that so that you can continue to reproduce that strain. So, uh, so there's a place for both in our industry. Um, if you did seeds, uh, depending on how much they've been hybridized, how many different generations, if you're within about three generations or so from the original uh, mothers, the original strain, the diversity could be all over the map. I remember I, uh, I used one of my favorite herbs to grow is Stevia rebaudiana, a sweet herb of Paraguay. And I grew it with my wife. And when the seeds first came out from Holland, they were only the third generation of seeds that were on the market. I planted those up, and they looked like different plants. There were tall ones, there were short ones. It had some with smooth leaves, edges, some with serrated edges, big leaves, small leaves. It was like Mendel's garden. But it was, it was kind of fun, though, because then I got to choose from those and say, these are the ones I like the most for the, for the larger leaves, a bit more sweetness. The, the leaves of Stevia rebaudiana, they're 30 times sweeter than sugar and no cal calories. So I was getting some plants that were three times as big as what it said on the seed pack. And those award winners in your new moms. So, uh, so we could go. We're going to do a little bit on both. Uh, the seeds are pretty simple. We'll start with that. One of my best seed starters for hydroponics is rockwool. This is rockwool right here. Rockwool is actually made from basaltic rock and limestone. It's been heated to about 3,500 degrees, melted, then it's poured on spinning cylinders sort of like making cotton candy. And then it's going to be shaped in different sizes. So it's about 85% air 
So this is the perfect air to water holding capacity. Excellent for starting seeds. If you're starting in soil, you want to make a, have a very light soil with a lot of good drainage. So you have very good aeration to the roots. Because if it, you start to have a too dense of a soil, it's too wet, it can uh, set up an environment for anaerobic fungi. Those are the bad guys, the root runs, the rhizoctonia, the pythium. A little bit of oxygen will kill them. So if you have a, a so starting soil, it's very good aeration, have snowy white roots and they'll get, have a better start. But rock wolf is excellent too. It has uh, zero cation exchange, so it doesn't lock up any minerals. It's all available to the plant all the time. It starts out sterile, which is good for clean seeds. And again, they're going to root very quickly. I've planted basil seeds on Friday afternoon, come in on Monday morning, and they were already germinated and started to pop up. That's common in rock wolf. The downside of rock wolf is that it is very alkaline right out of the package. Plants like slightly acidic conditions. Somewhere, you know, 7.0 is neutral. Uh, plants like somewhere between about 5.8 and 6.4 is a good zone for plants. Well, the, the rock wool is, is too high a pH right out of the bag. So you want to condition it the first time you use it. So what you would do is you mix up some water and uh, adjust your pH with a mild phosphoric acid. Phosphoric acid would be great because phosphorus actually stimulates earlier root production, energizes the rooting process. So when you're, you're conditioning your rock, well, you're actually giving it a nutrient that'll help with the rooting at the same time. So you adjust your pH to about 5.5. Then you pour it over your, uh, over your tray, a standard tray here, that was about 98 cubes in there, or 98 seeds. For cuttings, you want something a little bit bigger, more like inch and a half or two inch blocks. But these are only about one inch, 30 cubes. But you pour it until it's completely submersed, and then you want to pour off the water after you do that so it's not sitting in a puddle. Because that will fill up all those pore spaces. Pour it off, then just add one seed to each hole. There's pre drilled holes in the rock hole, so if you never use it, take a look at it afterwards how it works. And then you cover it with a humidity dome. That'll keep the humidity at about 98% under the dome, which is ideal for germinating seeds. Uh, and then, if they're tropical type seeds, put them on a heating mat. It'll warm up the bottom, the seeds will germinate faster. If you're growing a cool weather crop like lettuce, you do not use a heat mat. But any tropical seeds, peppers, tomatoes, tropical flowers, and herbs, then a little bit of bottom heat is going to be beneficial for the germination. And then I, that, once you do that, then you slide it under full spectrum fluorescent lights. You don't need a lot of light to, to germinate seeds. In fact, a lot of times they'll germinate without light. But if you don't have any light, they'll, they start looking for light and they'll start to stretch right away. That's bad. If your plants start stretching early on, they're tall and spindly, that's going to affect the entire I mean, they could die or it could affect the whole life of the plant. So you want to start with nice, short seedlings with thick stems. So uh, light is a good thing. You don't need a lot. Um, if you have just regular shop lights with full spectrum lights, I like to put four bulbs over the plant. And keep it about three inches above, above the growing tips. And as, so when they germinate, they, they already see the light. Uh, you could use just cool white fluorescence. A lot of, Commercial growers will just use cool whites because they, they do have all the colors. But personally, I think adding a full spectrum light with some extra red in it is good because the red end of the spectrum stimulates rooting. The blue part of the spectrum helps keep the plant short and stocky. So if you get the short and stocky plant with thick stems, dark green foliage, because blue is responsible for chlorophyll production more than any other color. Also, with plenty of blue, lots of light there, they'll have thicker cuticle cells, that's the waxy covering, so the plants will be stronger, more disease resistant, hold water a little better. And if you were to look at the leaves under a microscope, the pores, the stomata, will take in CO2 to grow, there'll be more of them, they'll be denser and closer together. So that blue is extremely critical to keep a nice, tight, thick stem seedlings. 
to it, but that extra red is going to stimulate more root production. And you don't see that, but you want to have a good root development at the beginning. And if you can have less top growth and more root growth, that's going to be a healthy seedling that's going to be a very good producer for you, typically, down the road. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's the middle. I was just going to say, that's a point. Uh, you need a, a, a long photo period, I would say 18 hours, but I like to go 24 when I'm starting. And the only reason is because they're not, all the seeds aren't going to germinate at the same time. So if the, the light's on, when those seeds pop up, I want them to see the sun, I see the sky. They don't need to start. No, they don't. They not just, not they just start out at that stage. I would go 24 hours a day until the first true leaves appear. Now the first leaves that appear are the embryonic leaves, the leaves that were in the seeds, the cotyledons they call them. And they'll pop out first, a lot of times they just dry up and fall off. But that first set, next set of leaves, those are the first true leaves. And you know, when you see those, you probably have roots, if you have roots. And at that point, I'll take a little peek underneath the rock with starter cube to see if roots are starting to pop out. Any time after that, I can transplant. Just break off the little ice cube, roots and all. They don't have to, there's no transplant shot. Put it into your growing medium or putting it into a larger piece of rock wool or even transplant into soil. You don't, if you have the larger blocks, I don't want to transplant those into soil because they're light. So if you get a big rain outdoors and you had a four inch block, it's going to pop out of the soil like a cork. But a small starter cube, it'll root, it'll acre, and the plants will continue. So it's a very good, very good way to start seeds. I will say though that once the seeds germinate, they're popping out, you can, you can start to take that humidity dome off. I take it all the way off at that point. It's 98% relative humidity under the dome, but after they germinate, I don't want really high humidity because then you can start getting uh, mold or fungus. So the best way, this is the way you're supposed to do it, is you're supposed to gradually acclimate the plant and open it up a little for a few hours and close. You know what though? I've done it that way. I've taken the <coughs> dome right off. It's the same either way. They're, they're so young. They just, it doesn't take much for them to adapt. You want them when to take the dome off and put them under full big lights, they'll you'll fry them. But just to, as a graduate, taking the dome off, once they're fully established, absolutely good. No, no problems. How, how about fertilizing with that? I mean, that's not, that's not too wise. No, the uh, seeds have everything stored in the seed that they need to start. All they need is water only. Because they stored all the minerals that they need and the uh, carbohydrates to get started. But once you see those first true leaves, at that point, they need a little fertilizer. What, do you believe in anything about that Epsom salt and water? You know? Epsom salt is magnesium sulfate. It's one of the elements that plants need. And it uh, is magnesium <coughs> is a central element of chlorophyll. It, you, you'd want to have that. We'll get that to, that, to the next slide, actually. It brings us to the next slide. Improving rooting. And once you get it started, this will this stuff we're going to talk about here applies to either the clones for improving rooting or to seedlings to improve early rooting in the early stages. First of all, you want to use a, a mild nutrient solution with phosphorus in it, a little extra phosphorus, and with chelated micronutrients, the trace elements. So a full spectrum fertilizer would be good. But a very small charge, half strength, even quarter strength will be fine just to get them going. The lower, the milder the nutrient, the more it's going to stimulate vegetative growth. And you just say it's very important to be careful with growing at this point. Well, at this, at this point, the plants will prefer the ammonium form of nitrogen mm -hmm. the most, especially early on. Um, it's kind of hard to overdo it with the, at the early stage with the nitrogen. But during, as you start getting developed and into early vegetative growth, I would uh, watch the excess nitrates. Uh, I'll talk to you more about that when we talk about mother plant nutrition. But phosphorus is important. Now, phosphorus is the energy element. It energizes the rooting process and it energizes early flowering and more flowering sites. In the first two or three weeks before transplant, the plant will assimilate about 65% of the phosphorus it needs for the whole life of the plant. So, you, so if you're going to go to a really slum, 
mild nutrient formula, full spectrum, sprinkling just a little extra phosphorus. Uh, in the commercial growing, they don't just have a grow and a bloom. They have a starter fertilizer, then grow, then maintenance, then maybe a boost. What makes a starter fertilizer a starter fertilizer a little extra phosphorus, usually in the form of monoammonium phosphate, because that ammonium form of nitrogen actually aids with the uptake of phosphorus. So it's going to be, if you want to do more like the pros, it's to pinch more phosphorus early on. You can see as much as 20% increase in uh, roots at transplant with that. So if you do use a root stimulant, a little extra phosphorus is going to make it work better because it will energize that whole rooting process. Uh, you want chelated micronutrients that are available. They get locked up easily. Chela means claw. So a chelate is an organic molecule that attaches to your trace elements, iron, copper, manganese, and zinc. Attaches to them like a claw, keeps them soluble, keeps them available to the plant. Uh, but it holds them loosely enough that it uh, releases them to the plants on demand. And one of the key ones for rooting is zinc. Zinc is the cofactor for the formation of auxin. That's the, the rooting hormone. You need zinc to make rooting hormones. So make sure that you have zinc available in a chelated form, and also watch your pH. You want to try to keep your pH between about 5.8 and 6.4, even early on. If it gets above 6.5, iron starts to become unavailable. If the pH goes up above 7.5, which is just barely alkaline, all the metals, copper, iron, manganese, and zinc, become unavailable to the plant. We can put them in there, the plant can't use them. So chelated micros are the best and a good pH. And that's really it to, to, get, to really get the roots going. To improve the rooting process, though, you want to maintain the root temperature between about 68 and 75 degrees. The warmer the water temperature, the less dissolved oxygen that it will hold. So if you get up to 78 degrees, I've seen clone machines where the roots are suspended in air, but the temperature is 78, 80 degrees, they were getting slimy. They were starting to get root rot. But that's an anaerobic bacteria. So, but if you keep the temperature between 68 and 75, there's plenty of dissolved oxygen. It'll literally kill the root rot on contact. And the oxygen is important for metabolism. They need for root metabolism. They need available oxygen. So uh, temperature helps with metabolism. If you want more roots, I'd go up toward the higher end, toward 75. If you want to be really safe, 70, 72 is a really good safe zone. Uh, I comment? recommended, especially for a clone machine, but you want a little more root 75. You get to 78, you're rolling the dice for problems. You get into the 80s, you're asking for problems. Okay. I don't want to tell too many stories because we'll never finish there, but I remember one of the first clone machines that I uh, sold to someone who wanted to do clones, and I told them, I said, well, here, there's, a, there's an extra port for a submersible heater if you had to use it, you know, in the winter. It was really cold. Well, this was the middle of the summer. He came back and said, oh, all of his clones were dying. I said, what, well, the clone machine? With all that, how can they be dying? And I went through, what's the pH? What's, you know, what's the nutrients? And then finally, well, what's the water temperature? 85 degrees? I said, 85 degrees? He said, well, you told me to put a submersible heater in. No, not in the summer. Really, you don't even need to put a submersible heater in a clone machine. I found that there's, there's enough from the light, and there's also enough from the 
commercial pump to reduce. If anything, you want to add a little fan in there to cool it down. But that was the first one that came out years and years ago. But uh, you have to be careful. You don't want too much heat. That'll, that'll kill your phones really easily, very quickly. Let's see what else. Oh, seaweed extracts. Excellent to add to your nutrient early on. Now, seaweed extracts stimulate cell division. They have uh, natural hormones called cytokines, and they have auxins. They have rooting hormone in them. In fact, if, and they also have gibberellins. If any of you have seeds that are a little bit old, uh, that may, or maybe weren't stored quite properly, you can take a seaweed extract, soak your seeds overnight, and they'll, you'll get up to 30 or 40 percent better germination rate because they have gibberellic acid in it. The gibberellic acid starts the cascade of germination. But I can't guarantee you the results. I've had some people have really old seeds, and I told them about it. They used the seaweed extract, all of them germinated. But none of them grew because they just didn't have, they were, didn't have enough carbohydrates stored and you know, they'll germinate, but you need more than just get started. There has to be some stored carbs to get them going too. So I won't guarantee it will work, but it will help. So you get earlier germination rate, faster germination, and a better overall germination rate if you do that. But the other hormones in there, the, the oxids and the cytokine, and stimulate cell division. So if you root it up, add it to those little roots, even just little nubs of roots that are starting, you'll get more lateral root growth and more root mass. That's the main ingredient in a lot of the uh, root stimulant products that are out there, some of those very expensive ones. To make it work even better, though, combine the seaweed extracts with humic acid. They work together synergistically. Virginia Tech did a 10-year study on biostimulants, and they found that five parts humic acid, two parts seaweed extract, were 50% better than either of them alone. So that's a really nice combination. A mild charge of nutrients, a little touch of phosphorus, and some seaweed humic acid combination. If you want good health, strong, healthy roots, that's good. And we've even done, well, we'll go into that later. I'm going to get into You more. said five acid, two seaweed? Five parts humic acid and two parts seaweed was the combination that Virginia Tech said worked the best, was the most effective. So you can try that. And uh, one thing I like is just a little added benefit, just to kind of top it off, a little bit of B vitamins. In the old days, it was super thrive. Everyone would use it. Now, it does a couple of things. One, B vitamins, B vitamins here, especially B1, a combination of about five or six B vitamins. Super thrive is one that's been around all of our lives, right? Since the 40s. It's been around. Uh, it's just going to add a little bit of benefit to it. It's not uh, by itself, I mean, just B1 spray on plants not going to do much. But in combination with the seaweed, the hormones, and the trace elements, those humic acids are loaded with beneficial trace elements like the iron, copper, manganese, and zinc. They activate the enzyme for metabolism. So that's why the two work together. One's the signal, the other's the amplifier. But B vitamins also do that. Another thing that B vitamins do is it stimulates the plant's systemic induced response. Systemic induced response. It's like a good insurance policy for plants. It literally puts the, one dose will put the plant on high alert. It primes the plant, it sensitizes the plant. So if they do come under attack by pythium root rot, or they do come under attack by stress or, or a pathogen, the plant's natural immune system responds instantly. That's called systemic induced response. And they only discovered that in the last two years, the plant scientists. We've known it with Super Thrive all our lives. But they finally proved it two years ago in plant science. Yeah. And there's one other thing that, that B vitamins do, even in soil, when you're growing your plants, they stimulate the metabolism of the microorganisms in the root zone, the plant growth promoting rhizobacteria. And some of those microorganisms, when their metabolism and they're splitting and pop, 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 reproducing, they produce IAA. The microorganisms will make rooting hormone right on the roots. So again, that little bit of B vitamins, it does kind of insurance for the plant, but maybe in soil, 85% of those B vitamins be eaten up by the microbes, but they're going to feed the plant. So that's very good. This combo right here, 
would be a beautiful tonic to get your roots going right after the seeds germinate or right after the clones start to root. Is a question? Yeah, are we talking about this water or if it prefers to miss it too? We'll talk about uh, misting next. It's a little bit different for mixing, but we're at, right now we're talking about root feeding. About the root feeding. Any other questions? This, this, if you could come up with your own little, uh, your own little recipe with this, it'll be beautiful. Yeah, once you have that, the first true leaves. Anytime after that, yeah, you know you have some roots. Yeah, embryonic leaves, you don't want to put any fertilizer on them. You don't need it. Let the seed feed it. They don't, they don't need it. It's already everything that the plant needs is in the seed. <laughs> so once you get that first so set of serrated leaves and you start to very light. Small, a light feed, just a charge. And it, it makes a difference because it activates the enzymes to make more roots. Okay, so that's about it for the... <clears throat> Yeah, I, I discovered him and, and uh, what's the other fulvic acids and B vitamins, and I've seen a great increase from that. But I got to try to see. see. Oh, that, that's going to do. That's going to be the main thing. Okay. That's going to activate it because that has the again. That's the signal it says to make roots or to make buds or make a new growth. But then the, the humic acid amplifies that effect. But the trace elements. Is there a difference between dry seaweed like the seaweed flakes versus liquid seaweed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are the um, there is a dried seaweed that's just round up seaweed, and that's what you would use in a compost pile. It's not very and there's sludge; it wouldn't be very water soluble. Then there's seaweed extracts, the powdered ones that are just the water soluble part. They're extracted from the seaweeds. That's going to be very potent. That's going to have your best results because when you add that to water, that powder to water and mix it up, it's full potency. Will it truly dissolve? It will dissolve on you know, pure, pure hydro, and I, people are saying use this, use that, and clogs my stomach. If you're uh, using, you know, that's a good, that's a very good point. If you have, uh, if you're special. using a well, mycorrhiza and hydroponics is kind of weird no, uh, because those are fungi. That's I don't want to hold another class. Well, it's just, <laughs> it's, it's just an additive that's supposed to be soluble, but it's not. It's in a class, and even you have, want to be careful about how much organics you add if you're doing a clone machine. Yeah, really. Maybe in that case, well, real, real light dose of this because it can clog up the yeah, yeah, yeah. I like your advice right here. Yeah. Okay. But if uh, you're watering them in, this is a really excellent tonic. Yeah, we'll tell alpha. you about the the foliar in a second. What a little alfalfa help it out? Alfalfa. There's uh, tripodinols, uh I think that's what they call them, mm -hmm. that help with rooting. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. A lot of people take that and they'll take the, take a tea out of it to extract it. Then they can add other nutrients and water it in. Okay, uh, mother plants. There's a, that's a good way to start your plants. A lot of people just go vegetative growth, and then right before they go to flower, the plants are only six weeks old, and they take cuttings, but they're too young. They don't have enough stored energy in them yet. They should, the plants should be at least two months old. Three would be even better. You'd like to take a cutting that's as big around as a pencil for the stem. That would be great, you know, to get a stronger, you know, to have a really weak cutting to start with with barely any energy. It takes a long time to, to root, and by the time it roots, it might die before it even has a chance to root. So uh, having a mother plant, healthy moms, healthy clones. Uh, and for fertilizer for mother plants, it's different than your regular growth formula. Yeah, okay. can you tell me? You know, in, in a, for a mother plant, you want to have just adequate amount of nitrate nitrogen, not luxury amounts. Your grow formulas have a lot of nitrates because they get all this top growth. But about 30% of the energy of photosynthesis goes to assimilate the nitrates. And it's a luxury element. If you give them more nitrates, they will assimilate those nitrates. And it burns up the energy into top growth but it's not stored energy. It's not stored up in the, in the, tish, the new tissues. Also, it will restrict or inhibit root growth. because There's less leftover sugars to go to the roots. So mother plant, you want good balance between top growth and roots. You want a, the battery to be fully charged. You want 
all the carbohydrates charge up fully in the tissue. So when you take the cutting, it roots faster. <coughs> so your first trick, anyone that's doing less doing uh, commercial cuttings, they'll have a one to one potassium to nitrogen ratio. Where we have a one and a half to one in grow formulas a lot of times. I should tell you what I'm finding, I mean your first advice there, I don't try to clone them until they're at least three months old. Three months is better. And I, I find that I have a whole lot more good hormones in the lower branches at that time. Mm -hmm. And what I'm getting is exactly what you're saying is runway topper. And I'm, I'm just getting to where I gotta bend them over. I can't, you know, they get so damn tall. We're pulling back. Yeah, and I'm, I'm what do I do? Cut the tops off? Come on, no, I'm gonna hurt the plant. Okay, that's nitrogen. I can lower nitrogen. Yeah, they're able to store more of the carbohydrates instead of burning them just for growth. The second part there is the increasing the uptake of calcium. And the way to do that is by amino acids. So you down regulate your nitrogen, but up regulate your calcium. That doesn't mean just add more calcium, because it could just sit there in the reservoir and do anything. But if you add amino acids, two of the amino acids, glutamic acid and glycine, they chelate the calcium to keep it soluble, but they also stimulate root cells to open up calcium ion channels. So the plant will take up calcium a thousand times faster than simple osmosis. So if the plant's taking up more calcium, thicker stems. It's used to build, it's the glue that glue, glues the cell walls together. The stems will be thicker, Instead of getting with excess nitrates to big cells with thin cell walls, you'll have smaller cells with thicker cell walls. You'll be able to retain the water and the sugar and the amino acids. And the amino acids aid with the uptake of calcium. Would you recommend the red spectrum white as well as the blue with the mother plant? Yeah, I'd recommend both. But uh, like the blue is, again, the blue is like vegetative. Uh -huh. the stronger the blue, the little bit of red just helps. Like 20 or something? Yeah. When I've used metal halides a lot of times in the past, I'll use my D5s and mostly blues for my moms. Because I, I really want to hold, I don't want them to stretch. Yeah. And the other thing oh, that, yeah, the other thing I found out by cutting back those nitrates and improving the calcium uptake, the same amino acids that aid with calcium uptake, down-regulate the nitrogenase activity. So it's like a thermostat oh, okay. for nitrogen. So you get that nice two-inch internodal length all the way up the plant. And that's what we want. We want tighter nodes. Because yeah. when you take a cutting on the bread, if you have two nodes that you can root instead of one, twice the roots. But at least one. But the nice tight internodes are, are what we're after. And the, improving the calcium uptake, also helps prevent the stretch of your mom's. The rest is just like any other plant nutrition. And, you know, adding this humic acid to the sea, we make good, more root mass. It also stimulates the plant to make more plant protection agents, by the way. I try to give you what you want. There is something to it. Yeah, there is. There is something to it. With, uh, if you look at what the professional propagators are doing, they have a little different balance of nutrients than what a grower would do to this most big plants, lots of plants. Well, I want that too. Well, that, but for your moms, you just want to really help and clones. Okay, now let's get to our, here we go, the foliar spray. So. <coughs> there are the same ingredients we were talking about a little bit, but a little variation on the theme for what we're doing for the roots. Kelp is still the one you want to do your main ingredient for your foliar. Uh, but then instead of humic acid, fulvic acid. So they're smaller molecules, they're more biologically active. They'll literally take the, the trace nutrients through their cell membranes, release them inside the cell where they're needed the most. The humic is a little better at the roots because they're larger molecules and they hold on to the minerals and it's easier for the roots to take them off. That's the difference between humic and fulvic acid. Some hum states don't recognize it. Some states don't recognize a lot of things. They're, yeah, they're, 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 they're a little bit. I just got back from Canada. And, they don't uh, recognize Michigan. They don't recognize neem oil. Really? In Canada. <laughs> Come on. I mean, I'd be lost without neem oil. <laughs> there was somebody over there. They, had, they did a show kind of like I'm doing. And they mentioned neem oil as being effective against 
you know, spider mites and against aphids or something. And uh, they were fined fifteen thousand dollars just for saying that on tape. So I get a little nervous when there's videos over there. That video. Uh, no, there's really not any plant hormones in seaweed. We're just making that up. <laughs> no, because as soon as you say the hormone, all of a sudden it's a plant growth regulator, and they say it's an insecticide. Come on, it's not true, but that's. Try arguing with the regulator sometimes. Yeah. It's like beating your head against the wall. I don't, I don't even go there. I would, you could not pay me. You say, Harley, I'll double your salary. And all you have to do is work with the label regulators all day and help them to uh, help do that. They say, uh, no, I'd rather take have two good years that I enjoy instead of one year of total headaches. Keep, keep your money. But anyway, foliar spray, these are three good things. Okay. The uh, help, of course, number one. Combine it with full liquid instead of humic, it's as better as a foliar, and a little bit of yucca extracts. That's a natural surfactant that breaks the polarity of the water so it doesn't beat up on the waxy covering, and it'll absorb by the plant more, more evenly and uh, more effectively. Is there a benefit to using that as opposed to, say, a non antibacterial dish soap, which I yeah. use a couple of drops? It's, it's a small one. There is an advantage over it. The uh, dish soap is a sodium based oh, salt, well, okay. and plants no. really don't, no, they don't like need that. sodium, but it, a couple of drops is going to trigger plant I don't think so. Yeah, but it just helps it not beat up on the leaf. Yeah. Also, uh, for the kelp, you were talking about uh, pushing away parasites. I'm sorry, I had a, had a stroke and sometimes my speech is a um, Repelling parasites. Mm -hmm. Kelp, I've heard, has a in very small scale has a sharp aspect to it that helps deter mites from wanting to crawl on plants because it cuts them off. Is there any truth to this? Do you know of any of this? You're uh, very close. Yeah, there is some truth to that. The seaweed does have some abrasive molecules in it okay. that will kind of cause lesions on the insect. If it's on there. Like diatomaceous it, earth will? Well, diatomaceous earth is really sharp. A lot sharper. That's the yeah, so fossilized right. remains. Yeah. So they're like little razor bars, but this is just creates an abrasion okay. on the bug, and that means that your insecticidal soap or oils or whatever you're using will penetrate them better and be more effective. Yeah, I didn't know if Jay was just making me around. Okay. No, it's true. There's actually a safer insecticidal soap on the shelf. If you look at the label carefully, it says with seaweed extract. Okay. Thank you. And that's good for the plants too. So. Let's go. We don't use a. Silica in that in your foliar spray. Silica would be helpful too. Uh, it's not that much. It's going to be absorbed by the 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 the, uh, the foliage. But if the plant's under attack, the plant literally mobilizes the silica to the <coughs> plant infection mm -hmm. and crystallizes the cells. Mm -hmm. It also will help them to be a little stronger. You know, it would be you could add it to there. Uh, it have some beneficial effect. But I, don't, I wouldn't consider it a key ingredient like the uh, kelp in the foliage. Um, yeah, it would, it would be helpful, yes, as a foliar, but not as a small amount of improvement. But there might be some other things. Other thing, uh, if I thought it over, I could probably add a couple more things to the foliar as well. But I'm looking more now just to help with your moms so that they'll root faster when you take the cuttings. Okay, here's what the seaweed does. First of all, you want to spray out to a light mist on your mom's about two weeks before you take cuttings. About two weeks before, um, and I call it stage zero of cloning. The next, what happens is the seaweed is high in cytokines that stimulate cell division. So at the roots, more root cells. At the, at the, uh, as a foliar, it stimulates more lateral bud development. It breaks what's called the apical dominance, the top growth and the and it stimulates the plant to make more side branches. And those branches are where your cuttings are. Those are the cuttings. Mm -hmm. And it'll also have tighter nodes. So again, two weeks before, they're going to stimulate more lateral bud development. And they literally draw nutrients <coughs> into the tissue, the cytokines do. If I had a leaf, I put one drop of water with cytokines in it, cut it off and put it on the table, that whole leaf would turn brown, except one little island of green it literally pulls nutrients into those tissues and keeps that tissue juvenile. Again, that's going to be really good for your clones. If they're pulling in more sugars, they're pulling in more minerals, they're pulling in more water with that, along with it, 
If you, the, if you take a cutting, it has no roots. It's separated from the moth. So it has to rely on the stored minerals and energy in that tissue to make the initial roots. And after that, it just goes on and makes photosynthesis. It's on its own. So that is going to draw nutrients into those developing tissues, even at the downstream effect. Or break the apical dominance so you don't have that one big tall middle one. You get more side branching, bushier plants. And but be careful. They, uh, especially with the really, really good seaweed, the very potent ones, they're so powerful that if you overdo it, you can burn your plants. Some of the other for foliars, right? For foliar spreads. The uh, use it no more than once a week. During the, that's, the, that's the most, right? Once every two to three weeks will still have a beneficial effect on the plant. But if you use too much and too often, you can actually have a negative effect on the plant. So that's the one caution with this one. This is powerful. Uh, I'm going to say one thing, though, that I just tried <laughs> recently. We had some clones that, and I'm talk, right now I'm still talking about spraying on your moms, but you could also do this spray on your clones themselves once they start getting good, some roots. We had some very, what I should call it, unhealthy clones. In fact, I looked at them and I said, I think we should start over. I don't think they're going to do very well. And uh, my wife, Sue, that's Sue back there, she's, uh, you know, she loves her plants, and she didn't want to kill them. <laughs> she wanted to try to save them. So I went, ah. okay then. While we're starting the clones, to see if we can save these. So I made a tonic, just like I said, oh, well, what would I do, do for my own advice? So I did kelp and, and fulvic acid, 5 to 2 ratio, just like Virginia Tech said. Little tiny bit of yucca as a wetting agent. We did a fine mist on those sick clones. Two days later, two. I'm not exaggerating, Sue, right? Two days later, roots were popping out of those four inch rock blocks that we had on them. Within four or five days, they were greening up, they were looking great. Dang. And right now, I don't know, I haven't seen them lately. They're, how do they look? Pretty beautiful. beautiful. So, every once in a while I have to take my own advice and say, hey, man, let me try this. So I made up a little tonic, and it worked for the clones too. Now, I don't normally recommend stuff like that because, uh, you know, there are a sick clone, there could be a lot of different things going wrong. But in this case, it worked. Nicely. So that's a good one, but just be careful. Uh, let's see, how are we doing? Oh, we'll talk about the cutting itself. This is probably pretty rudimentary, but you want to take, uh, a lot of times you take two cuts when you're doing clones. Uh, you want to do it, your, your last cut right below a node. A node is where the leaf or the branch is attached to the stem of that branch. And that's where the little bud is, right there. <coughs> so if you cut just below that node and trim with a razor blade, cut this off so it's just uh, even with the, with the stem, then a lot of, uh, and just to take a little of that bark off, just break some down to the cambium layer right below it, that's where a lot of your roots are going to pop out of along that, along that area. How you can overdo that off. You know, some people are just, they want to whittle it, you know, you know and, uh, and if you're really good with a surgical cut, that's fine, but I think, I don't have that kind of time, but if I just take a nice cut, nice sli uh, surgical slice, now you don't want, you want to have very sharp scissors if you're cutting it, you, yeah, or a scalpel or a razor blade is even better, because if you, cr you don't want to crush the stem when you're cutting it. They could literally, when you crush it, you're squeezing it. Think slow motion, you're cutting it, squeezing the stem, and then when you finish the cut, it will suck in oxygen. Mm -hmm. It could create an embolism in, the, in, in that cutting. But a nice, sharp, surgical cut, it would, uh, it, it'll work much better. And uh, I, personally, I'd like to have two, not just one note, I'd like to have two. Now, if you're using the, your, the right mother plant nutrition, you will have those nice two. You can use two. On like a clone machine, I love them because I can do two nodes underneath it. When I'm doing it in, a, in soil, sometimes I can only get one node, but I prefer to do two. So if you have tighter nodes, you can get better results, more roots. Uh, also, 
there, you can't really see it in this light here, but you know, I cut right below that node, so there's about two or three inches of stem above the node here. Now that would just get infected and can rot. So what I would do there is I would trim off that little extra right to the next node, and then two branches will come out right, where you left it. So if, uh, yeah. I got a question. Yeah. Is there any truth between, behind the uh, 45 degree angle cut? Does it open up more sur surface area? There's, there's some there? truth to it. Uh, it not, open more it's area, but it's not that much. Really though, you know what? It's, you're splitting hairs when you get to that. You know, I'm cutting straight across, cutting at an angle. If you cut at an angle, yeah, you're going to have an oval instead of a circle. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have more area exposed for roots. It's, it's more important to have a healthy mom for that than it is. To, but I think 45 degree angle, why not? Might as well. Just as easy to do 45 and just go straight across. Something I've done to avoid embolism. Yeah, I would take it right off at the stock and then I would put that under water and make it suck so that it didn't suck air. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. That's a good. That's a good point. That's why you know a lot of times you take the two cuts. So instead of cutting here right below the node, then going up and cutting off the extra stem, cut off just above that node, and then take the take it over to the second cut right before you dip it. And if, if you want to do the best, put that under water and take that second cut. It won't suck here. And it won't suck here. That's the ideal. So you know what? The plants are so resilient. I've just I've cut them. I've had some I'm just trimming off. Oh, I'll just strip some off by hand and just stick it in water and they grew. They rooted. But we're not telling you what not to tell you the way it should be done. But then any kind of compromise you make is still be closer to being successful. So that's it. Two cuts is better than one. And uh, two nodes for rooting is better than one. Okay, the rooting gel. Uh, the, a lot of the, there's two different types, types of gel. There's some that are gels, some that are powders. Powders will work. A lot of people like them. The gels, I like, but I've heard for a bit better. We've been doing it for years. Oh, by the way, I did not, there's a rumor out there that I invented Clonex. That's not true. No, you laughing, but it's not true. When I started, they already had Clonex. I have literally taught tens of thousands of people how to use Clonex, but I did not invent it. Well, I like the product. <laughs> now he's getting another guy. Yeah, he said he made Clonex. <laughs> just in case anyone out there and they say he didn't make Clonex, they okay, you are right. <laughs> but anyway, the cellulose based gels, I like them because it seals the wound. Yeah. And that kind of helps prevent an embolism in and of itself. It can do, and also, it keeps those rooting hormones right on the stem and soak them up so they're just getting washed away right away when you water them. So I like the gels. Uh, they have a hormone in there called IAA, endobacteric acid. That's a synthetically manufactured organic molecules. And I, plants do have some IVA in them as well. But when you use that gel, the plant changes the IVA to IAA, into acidic acid. IAA is the plant's favorite rooting hormone, growth hormone. That's what they prefer. If I could squeeze out IAA, put it in a bottle, I would do it. That's what the plant likes the most. But there's no shelf life. If I put IAA in a bottle, it would, in two weeks at the most, it's done with this degree. But IBA lasts longer than when you put it on the plant, it changes it to IAA. And then later into do a harmless molecule. Uh, when you do have a gel, after you open it, you store it in the refrigerator. It doesn't say that on the bottle. It doesn't say that on the bottle. No, I need to know that. But you need to know this. <laughs> That's why you came to this class. Yeah. It teach you what's not on the bottle. It does say that it has IBA in it. One of these days they're gonna take that. I'm afraid they're gonna take it off the market and they just can see the new hormone. But they'll have a hard time because nurseries and propagators and gardeners need rooting hormones to do cuttings. Oh yeah. They'll work without it though. They took a cutting oh, yeah. without it. Yeah, they will. The uh, plant has IAA, yeah, it'll start to uh, drip out of the bottom of that cut. Start to break out that wound, wound it accumulates and they'll root. But it's going to just work with nature, give it a little dose. 
Uh, store the refrigerator, otherwise microorganisms can start to break it down too early and lose its so much potency. Also, do not dip cuttings directly into the bottle. Okay, here's one. If you dip, dip the cutting, you're contaminated. And then later on, if you if you shake it up and it's watery, it's done. Throw it away. But if you keep stored in the refrigerator, I would I would take some up. I'll put a little bit in. You know, before I move my cuttings, I warm up a little bit. But it's better. It'll feel the last longer and be more potent. And uh, the other thing here's a common one. Don't double double <laughs> dip your clone. This is a common mistake. If you do, you dip your clones. You're waiting a week. Still don't see. It looks like being a little bit of root. I know. I'll dip it again. No. If you do that, you, when you dip it the first time, it signals the plants like ringing the doorbell saying, "Make roots." But if you dip it later after it starts to have roots, it will literally inhibit root growth. It'll have the opposite effect. On it. So you don't want to double dip it. Uh, so, okay, but once you start to get those little roots, and you say, well, they're not rooting very well. You just see some tiny, tiny roots. That's when you use your root stimulant, the one I told you about earlier. But here's one of the difference between a, a rooting hormone and a root stimulator. This is one example here. <coughs> this is IAA. That's the, uh, the hormone that the plant likes the most. IBA is in here, but this is IAA. This is an amino acid called tryptophan. Plants take in tryptophan through the roots, take it up to the leaves, <coughs> and the plants change it into IAA. They literally change it into the rooting hormone. And then it's pumped to the new, for new root growth or to the growing tips. So look at the, the difference between these two molecules. Here's IAA, there's this part, same as that. This part, <coughs> same as that. This part, same as that. All it has is one little extra molecule of ammonium. When that gets snipped off, it's changed into an amino acid. Or it's changed into the rooting hormone. So that's what microorganisms do too. The plants are going to exude a little bit of tryptophan through their roots. And there are microorganisms that will change it into IAA, rooting hormone, right on the surface of the roots. So yeah, you could. You could spray it. A lot of people love to spray the amino acids on the leaf because it'll change, it'll make the amino acids right, or the hormone right there in the leaf, and then it's pumped. So if you have a little bit of a root disease, then the foliar is going to help them recover faster because they'll start to make more new roots, and then it has a better chance to recover. <coughs> so that's, that's one of the differences. So in amino acids, we also said, remember, it helps with the uptake of what element? Talked about earlier from other plants. It helps with the uptake of calcium. calcium. Good. Nature is so beautiful. Calcium activates the enzymes that pump the IAA, the growth hormone, to the tips and to that. So if you have plenty of calcium, it actually stimulates the plant to, to make more new cell walls and, and to grow. But if it's a secondary messenger in that case. So nature works together. If there's not enough calcium, then they say, well, admit, don't make new, you know, don't spend your energy trying to grow. Wait until you have all the raw materials you need to grow. But if you use a full spectrum nutrient, you have a good balance of those natural hormones, you get that uptake of calcium, wow, you are going to have, I literally, you know, I hear this all the time, the people that are doing this are claiming, these are claims from others, that they're rooting in their clones in half the time than they were before. And they had the right mother plant nutrition, and they were using the right kind of stimulus. Yeah. If, they were, if it took them 10 days before to root, it's five days. If it was a week before, it's three days. Because they have the energy to do it. Okay. And amino acids, so amino acids would be one more thing. You know, I definitely would add in my mother plant nutrient, because I need those strong plants. But you could add a little bit of that to your, to your little tonic, and it'll... Uh, Improve it just a little bit more. Gen Hydro's product, the uh, root stimulant, uh, what's it called? Rapid start. Like rapid start. Rapid start. Is that a, uh, I a tryptophan type of? I don't know if it has the amino acid tryptophan. Tryptophan is kind of hard to dissolve in water, but it's easily absorbed through the roots. So again, foliar would be great. If, and that this one I know, oh, I, I know this particular great. one is water soluble. It does have some tryptophan in it. I checked.
just okay. to make sure. When I did the mother plant nutrients, though, I didn't put it in because it couldn't, it couldn't dissolve enough for a concentrate. Right. You know, uh, but I was putting but it there at I the end. I have right? used the rapid start in my nutrient solution, and it does seem to make a difference in the first couple of weeks of that. I, I just would, wondered what, what action it would if, if you look at the bottle, I, I would be willing to bet that the main ingredient is kelp. If you see the extra. Okay. Well, I they all put it, this, they put it in all of it. The growth, growth stimulus, even the balloon stimulants have kelp in it because it's just so beneficial. So if you're only going to add one thing out of it today and just do improvements, add a little kelp at the roots for your moms, or for your clones, or the foliar for your two weeks pre take cuttings. If that's all you've brought out of this, you will see better results than you've had in the past without it. Okay, I think, oh, here we go. We'll just summarize here a few things. I'll go through this quickly. Um, big cuttings from the lower to middle branches are better than from the very top. <laughs> Remember the top growth, they're net importers. They're still importing carbohydrates. The ones that are a little lower on the plant, they're a little older, they are exporting. They're so the batteries charged. They get a little better result. You can take it from the top, it will root, but it takes longer. And they're not usually as good. Uh, take the vegetative tissue, not the woody part. The woody part's dead. Just, uh, so new growth on the older part of the plant. Uh, try to root, root at least two nodes, if possible. Again, you have good plant nutrition for moms. You're going to have tighter nodes. I've had some people claim that when they've used uh, some of the strategies I've been telling you today, that instead of 10 flowering sites, they have 15 flowering sites, just because of tighter nodes, just for veg in general. But for the moms, the other thing I didn't realize until later from you guys telling me was not only are you getting faster rooting because of the stored carbohydrates, stored energy, the mother plant recovers faster from the shock of taking the cuttings. So they have, can have fewer moms because they can they, they recover and start growing again so much quickly they can take more cuttings. So I didn't think of that. That's actually a side effect of having healthy plants with stored energy. Um, Water well a couple hours before you take your cuttings. You want your leaves to be turgid. You don't want to take cuttings from plants that are wilting a little bit. And you might not know this one. It's better to take cuttings at the end of the light cycle than it is in the morning. For professional growers, maybe in the um, overseas, where they're just doing cuttings, they will take their cuttings at night, store them in the refrigerator overnight, and, send and ship them the next day. They get better results than taking them in the morning and shipping them immediately. Because the plants are doing, they're doing respiration day and night. They're storing <laughs> carbs during the day. The light's on, they're, they're breaking them down. So actually they'll have less stored carbohydrates in the morning than they would at the end of the day. Some of it's a little bit, again, we're splitting gears here. It's not like one's going to work, the other one's not. Yeah. It's going to do a little, a little improvement. Uh, maintain high humidity. Of course, after you take your cuttings, you know, the humidity dome is good, or even just a little fine misting with water only, just to kind of keep them from drying out too fast. Wilting. Uh, full spectrum lighting again. Uh, be careful. I've done this with, with uh, clones where I had too much light on them, and it seemed to stress them because they're trying to do photosynthesis, but they don't have any roots yet to take up water. So I'd rather have milder light um, and uh, longer than I would have too bright of light or too much heat. My experiments, I use a 24 inch D5 on a 24 place rear high cloner and it seems to be just about perfect. Yeah. That sounds good. That sounds excellent. Uh, maintain water temperature, we talked about that before because you need the result, you need oxygen to pollute metabolism. And be patient. Let nature take its course. And this is the <laughs> <laughs> I hear the laughs already, you know, because that's what we do, especially when we're beginners, we're good. Let me see if they're rooting, you know, we're always trying to take a peek, and that's the worst, worst thing you can do, because you're disturbing the plant when you do it. I was it. trying to help, him. he had those rock wool plugs, the round ones, the slit down the side, and every day he was opening Nobody up to look, do have roots yet? You know, there's some people that, you know, when they have roots, so they like to give them a little tug to see if they're roots. <laughs> I'm laughing because I, I probably did it myself. So. I probably did too, but my goodness, I never do that now. <laughs> I wouldn't do it now. So you just walk away. So what I'll do, if I'm doing, using the clone machine and I take my cutting, 
dip it in the warm one and put it in there. I wait until just a little nub's growing, right? I'm just starting to see roots. That's when I add my, my little rooting one. Yeah, and that's and right then. Right right and I'll yeah. squirt it right on the root, right on the snail. Then I close it up and I walk away and I ignore it. I will not even look at it for like three or four days, just totally, won't even look at it. Not even looking at it. Even the, and then I come back and open it up. Roots popping everywhere. Nice food. And you want, you know, if you have more stored energy in the plant too, you're not just going to get those, a few little stringy roots hanging down, which are going to die back, and then they're going to make new growth. You'll have more of that lateral root growth. They're a little bit thicker roots. That's better with, with the fine feathery hairs on it. That is, those roots are good, are good roots. And then when you transplant, they'll come back. Here's another mistake I made early on in the clone machines. I thought, well, if I wait longer and get more roots, you know, if I let me, I'll wait instead of having three inch roots, well, maybe if I have 12 inch roots, that would be better. It they doesn't get growing, right? It doesn't because you put that you put that in water, uh, put them in, the roots die back, and they start making new roots. So, but that whole time the roots are dying back, they start to make new roots. The plant's just sitting there, it's not growing. So it's better. I didn't gain anything by waiting two extra weeks. It'd be better having a two-inch clone or a three-inch clone with three-inch roots. Okay. So just take over and just keep on going. Slow down. So I believe that is it. So now we're open to. We did it, Sue. Finished. Thank you, everybody. Any questions?